I was out walking along the Great Salt Lake, I was really hoping to see some brine shrimp. And suddenly, out of the water, came the sun flashing its light on this beautiful, large animal glistening on his back. I was just transfixed. Then, a little later, I got in my boat and it was out in the water there. And you know, I felt this bulge underneath the boat and he came around the same one and looked right at me. And you know, I looked right at him and it seemed like he winked at me. It was the most amazing thing. Well, soon after that, they started building I-15. There was so much commotion, the air was polluted, there was so much noise. And I think, I think all that commotion, he just needed to back off and find another place. Maybe northern Great Salt Lake, who knows? But I never saw that sweet thing again. Well, I saw one when I was helping fill sandbags during those flooding in 83. One of them swam right up State Street. But luckily, we were able to turn it around and help it head back to the lake. Yeah, I saw one when I was on a boating trip in 1998. And um, I was in art school, so I did quite a few drawings of it, which I uh, sent to uh, some of my friends who worked at Pixar. And they actually wound up using it for the uh, for the whale in, uh, in Finding Nemo. Oh, foot. It's been 64 years. 50 people went into the lake when our ship sank from under us. But that creature carried us back to shore. It was so huge we could all fit on its back. It was so huge, some people I was with worried it was going to eat us. I just wish they had mosquitoes. I had to go to the Farmington Bay Wildlife Refuge for a school assignment in junior high. My sisters and I call it the Mosquito Preserve. We saw one in the lake and it, it was so big and it was so exciting. It almost made up for all the mosquito bites. I'm still annoyed though because my science teacher didn't believe me and I didn't get any points. I was at the hot air balloon festival on Antelope Island with my kids and the hot air balloons that day were magnificent. So much fun to watch. And all of a sudden something caught my eye and I turned and I couldn't believe what I was seeing. It was so big and it was there one minute and gone the next. These are just a few of the stories that Utahns have of seeing blue whales in the Great Salt Lake. While some have seen them, not everyone believes them to be real. In this short film, we will discover the truth about Utah's whales. Our story begins in 1869 when workers completed the Transcontinental Railroad. Many people visited the lake that year, but were disappointed at its lack of life. One man, an English biologist by the name of James Whitcomb, sought to make something more of it. In 1870, he seeded algae in the water, and its blooms grew until they filled the entire lake. The year after that, he brought in a thousand gallons of krill-laden water. He let it evaporate until only a few gallons remained, and only the most salt-hardy krill survived. He released them into the lake, and over the next few years they multiplied until they formed swarms stretching for miles. This was all well and good, but no ecosystem is complete without secondary consumers. Mr. Wickham considered crab-eater seals, but Utah's climate is too warm for them. One day, it came to him. His final addition to the lake would be the largest animal in the world one that lives in both polar and tropical waters, the blue whale. It took four years of searching the high seas, but his work finally paid off in 1875 when he found two 35-foot-long calves, a male and a female, beached in Australia. Their mothers were lost, presumably crushed in the Antarctic pack ice. From this tragedy would spring new life. Mr. Wickham and his friends moved the whales into two specially built tanks that they had brought and sailed back to San Francisco in triumph. From there, he shipped the whales to Utah by rail. James Wickham named the male sulfur and the female cyan. He built them a pen half a mile wide at the mouth of the Bear River. 
However, the two whales made a beeline for the open water and tore through the wire pen with ease. Nobody saw the whales until six years later, in 1881, when Mr. Wickham's assistants were working on the lake. They saw a sign and sulfur eating krill, which were now known as brine shrimp, and noticed that the two whales had grown to about 60 feet long. In 1890, 15 years after their introduction, the public learned of the whales in the lake. Sign and sulfur had each grown to over 80 feet long and had produced three offspring. James Wickham and company were heroes. Unfortunately, this is where our story takes a dark turn. By this point, whalers were slaughtering blue whales in the North Atlantic and North Pacific. Greedy enterprises sought to do the same in Utah, even though there were only five whales in the entire lake. What happened next is shrouded in mystery and legend. Some say that the king of blue whales took a humanoid form and with his mighty powers, awed the Utah State Legislature into submission. All that we really know is that the whaling plans were called off and when somebody tried to restart them in 1904, the legislature banned all whaling in the state of Utah. Since then, the blue whales in the Great Salt Lake are elusive and rarely let people glimpse them. Their numbers are estimated to be around 100, but they usually stay in the deepest and remotest parts of the lake. Though some say that when Robert Smithson built his spiral jetty in 1970, it was as a platform to view them and as a monument to their majesty. What? Though many have seen them, many more have dismissed their existence as a hoax. But here in the Natural History Museum of Utah, we have a vertebra from a blue whale right here. This proves that they once existed, but the question remains, do they still? So, in 2021, I went on an expedition of my own to find them. The fate of the blue whales in the Great Salt Lake hangs in the balance. They can only survive as long as the lake does. In order to protect themselves from drought, the whales, much like crawdads, dig burrows into the mud where they can retreat to deeper water, but this is only a temporary solution. This year has bought us time, but to save the lake and its whales, we must do everything we can to conserve water. Otherwise, we will suffer a whale of a loss. Woo!